Okay, uh, welcome everyone uh, for these uh, series of tutorials, which start from uh, the tutorial by yours of Lib. I'm hoping that I'm uh, pronouncing his name right. And um, he will be, you know, like giving the tutorial for the set of lectures that uh, Simon Corant Watt uh, had been giving for the last week. Okay, on 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 uh, uh, S matrix bootstrap and so on. Uh, yeah, over to you, uh, Yves. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I'm going to just discuss, uh, discuss about, uh, the, the problems Simon gave and, uh, there, there, there are actually, uh, interesting physics in those problems that Simon, uh, didn't cover or didn't focus on in his lecture. So this is basically what I am going to do. And uh, um, during, during looking through the, the, the problems, I will um, basically explain a bit how to use the STBB and uh, things like that. I think this is the most important part. So let me share the screen and... Uh, So I basically have a have a two or three things to share. First is the solution, um, which is in PDF file, and I think I uh, may be able to upload it after after the session. Mm -hmm. And the second one, I think it's most is actually uh, more useful is the Mathematica notebook that covers how I solve those problems and how like how I call STPB and to run something that to solve those uh, the, the, the EFT bound steps. Okay, uh, can, can, if it may just interrupt, I mean, I just want to remind the audience that, you know, like uh, this assignment problems are all there in the website. You know, like in the, in the Asian Winter School website, uh, right uh, across uh, uh, Karan Huwat's lectures. Uh, in case uh, any of you did not know, okay, yeah, sorry, you wait. Uh, continue. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, so you you can see my screen, right? Uh, I think I'm now sharing the screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's better to maybe to look at the problem set first. I'm not sure um, this is uh, the most uh, up-to-date one, but uh, yeah, let's look at that. The first problem is about uh, the chaos bound. And uh, so what it's, it's a bit, actually it's a simple, it's a, it's a, it's a simple version is that so if we consider a transfer function that satisfies this formula, and it's actually just sort of a transfer function for the sigma model uh, uh, Simon introduced in his lecture. And uh, um, so uh, to consider this transfer function over some range of uh, the omega, the energy, and the idea is that uh, we use the unitarity that is this condition um, and want to use this unitarity to show that the, the exponent lambda is actually bounded. And the one, um, so this is actually just related to the, uh, the chaos bound. So how to show this is that, um, so first of all, we write this formula and we can write omega uh, which is energy, we analytically continue it to the complex to the complex plan, uh, basically the, the, the upper upper half plan. Uh, the way I chose to do is that I just uh, write omega in terms of uh, you know um, um, the absolute value of omega times uh, times uh, angle. Um, so if if I if we do so and we require the unitarity, we find this positive condition. So uh, and this positive condition, uh, but we we actually have ignored the quadratic term because 
uh, I think this the the problem assumes that c is small, uh, like it's a perturbative calculation. So we so we ignore this quadratic term, and then we can actually just just expand this uh, this positive inequality, and we will get equation zero point three. And if you look at this equation, it says that it has to it has to be positive for I mean, for adding C and for adding theta on the upper half plan. So for this to happen, you will find that sine lambda theta, I mean, it, uh, it, it, it shouldn't change its sign. So the only condition is that, uh, lam um, I mean, lambda times theta has to be less than pi. So this, this gives you, the condition that the lambda has to be between minus one and one. So this is a, a, a simple way to see why chaos bound exists from the analytic, uh, from the analyticity of transfer function. And uh, so, and there's some, there's a, also some details about this, about this problem like to, to prove the real part of C is positive, to prove the imaginary part of C is zero for, for maximal uh, chaos. But I'm, I'm not going through the detail, but the idea of this exercise is to show that the, the, the power of analyticity for ACE matrix, even though it's uh, in this problem, it's not technically the ACE matrix, but I mean, if, if it shows how it works. So it's just a warm up. And uh, are there any questions? So you can ask in any, you can drop it, drop, drop in any time. I'm fine with that. Yeah. So it's the first question is pretty simple. And this is interesting, interesting, a uh, problem is problem two. Um, is that if, so suppose now we, we are considering a signal model and it goes through a media with, with, with the resonant absorption of frequency omega zero. And the, the transfer function is this, where A is positive and it measures the optical depth of the, med, of the medium. So, um, I mean, how to show this media is causal and unitary. So for this part, we let's just don't think too much about uh, about uh, the physics behind, but just think about the the definition of causal and unitary. So for unitary, we have to require that the the uh, I mean, let's see how to change the screen sorry just give me a second there uh i have to change i have to kind of switch back and forth between between the laptop and in in the um ipad Yeah. So can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So for unitarity, what we have to show is that this one is less or equal to one. So this is simple. It's actually pretty straightforward. And for, for analyticity, what we have to show is that it is analytic in upper half plan. So this means that uh, uh, we want to show that it doesn't have any pole structure or branch cut in in upper half plan of omega. And this is indeed true if you look at the deflation. I think it's something like uh, I A. It's like uh, omega. Um, minus omega zero um, plus I 
Come on. So the 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 post structure there there is a there there exists some post structure, but the post structure is actually uh, located in the lower half plan. So it's it's all five with upper half plan. So it's, it's a basic basic idea. And uh, let me how do yeah let me switch it back. So if we look at if we look at this transfer function and we use the elasticity and unitarity to show that it should be causal, but then we actually encounter a very interesting situation. Here is that um, um, if we consider a specific signal, like uh, uh, in this problem, we consider a Gaussian pulse that is narrowly picked around the frequency omega zero. That that is, we consider such a um, input signal, and we can actually calculate the output signal. But the problem is that if we if you really do that, we find actually there will be some time advance. So to show this, let me transfer to the solution. So we uh, want to compute the output signal using this formula. It's actually just uh, you know the transfer function acting on the input signal, and you transform it back to the time domain. And and if you look at this formula, you uh, this equation expand the exponent around omega uh, equals omega zero. And that this is basically the stationary phase trick. So if you do so, you find actually you can absorb uh, some factors in S omega to the, to the exponential factor here. And so, uh, with with the additional exponential factor, but for this factor here, when you integrate over omega, it actually transforms it back to the back to the time domain, but with a different time. So in the end, you will find something like this: it's uh, approximately like a, a additional exponential factor times the input signal, but with the time with, with the time kind of a uh, with the time advanced, because here you find it's t plus some positive numbers. It means that uh, there exists a time advance. So the, the 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 question is that how it how it could be consistent, like you have time time advance, but it's still causal. So this is pretty interesting, and it actually happens in optical experiment that you will indeed measure this sort of a, this sort of a phenomena, but it doesn't violate causality at all because that is, I mean, the resolution is also simple. It doesn't violate causality because if you look at the additional exponential factor, you will notice that there exists just some, some factor of e to the minus a over gamma, which is, I mean, exponentially decay. So it, this factor highly suppresses the whole output signal. So the idea is that even though the peak, the Gaussian peak develops time advance, but the magnitude is actually highly suppressed. So it's allowed by causality because, because this output is actually triggered by the tail of input. So uh, when we say, the time advance violate causality. It means that uh, at the at the um, at the time range that there's no any input signal, but you find there is an output signal. It of course this sort of a time advance violates causality. But the idea now is that uh, you have you have a signal, you have an input signal extending to minus n. Uh, in, in, in extend to infinity in time, it's just very small. But this sort of tail could trigger output signal, which, which is also small. So it's all fine with causality. And 
to show you how this is possible, we might want to take a look at the at the real uh, at the demonstration how this how this is possible. So let's look at this. Let's look at uh, this is the input signal. So this input signal. And I choose the some of the uh, parameters Simone give. It's a, so just a sample parameters. You could you could play around it with with any parameter you want. Yeah, just just to see how how this whole things works. So let's first try to uh, look at the input signal. The input signal I actually divided by um, by an oscillating phase just to make sure it's a bit stationary. And uh, if you look at this thing, uh, you you do a, you you plot it. It's a Gaussian, and its peak is around the the, the peak is located at time equals zero. It's Gaussian, so it, it actually extends to infinity. It's just very small after around minus four. It's extremely small. And now we want to compute the output signal. So let's just compute the output. The output signal by by numerically doing the integral, numerically doing the Fourier transform. So let's take the 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 transform uh, function and do the Fourier transform. I, I choose to do the uh, use the n integrate this this sort of function in Mathematica to do this to do this integral. So for simplicity, uh, I mean not for 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 I mean precisely. So I choose a pretty high precision to make sure everything is okay. And so I can make this function uh, and I can also plot this function. I choose to use a list of plot just to make sure it won't have a bad behavior because I mean, uh, if you direct to plot, it will a little bit sometime, it's not just variable in Mathematica. So we we'll see, this 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 is the output signal. It's it's still Gaussian, so it's it's actually not distorted too much, but the peak develops uh, uh, a time advance around. Uh, you see this peak; it's around minus five, so it's it's around like it has time advance around five sigma. But you can also notice this: uh, it's the peak is actually around. 10 to the minus 33. So it's really small. It's a, it's actually just small, as small as the as the tail here. So this whole thing doesn't violate causality because it is just it, it is nothing but something triggered by this tail. So this time in advance is is harmless. It it's it's triggered by the tail of the original input signal. So this is the idea how we can think of it and there's no any violation of causality. Okay, are there any questions for this problem? Perhaps uh, can I can ask a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, can, can I? Yes, yes, please. Uh, okay. Uh, so in in that uh, uh you you uh, for the input in this case uh, your input signal is Gaussian but for example uh if you cut uh if you put some cutoff and if you input uh if you input only the tail of the Gaussian uh does it still reproduce the uh result um so yeah so it's a good question um, I'm not sure. So you're saying to to give a cutoff for the input signal or to the transfer function? Um, Perhaps the input signal, I think. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. let me try to understand. So, so you're asking yeah. that if, if you cut the tail, and how it will behave for the output? Does that have valid causality? Yeah. Um, that's... Yeah. So my quest. So so my answer is that I didn't try, but I think it deserves trying. 
So if you just set a cutoff, um, then we can again do the Fourier transform to see the output signal and to see if there's any if there's any uh, causality violation. But I'm not entirely sure because in that case the input signal is not analytic. Um, so yeah. But we can, we can of course do that. I'm, 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 I, I didn't do that, but uh, I think it's interesting. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it is necessary for the input signal to be really analytic, right? For causality to hold. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. Maybe certain smoothness is required, but. So that you know, like uh, you, you know, you can define uh, convoluting with the transfer function. But uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think there, there 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 should be some conditions for transfer function to be well defined. I mean, I, I not I mean not well defined. I mean, I it should exist some some conditions for input signals such that we can define a transfer function. Right, uh, maybe not, uh, but yeah. So the transfer function is uh, some kind of a distribution, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Probably some set of test functions are allowed, uh, uh, yeah. which you can multiply. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. So yeah, we can try. Like so, my 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 guess is that. Uh, well, actually, it's not just gas. It's actually just the original discussion in CMZ paper that Simon actually introduced in his lecture. Is that if you look at the input signal, like for example, you you give a cut here, so that there's nothing for minus uh, for for negative time. So you should see that the output signal is also zero for negative time. Otherwise, the causality will be violated. If so, if you see that the output is also zero, that means if it is, if it is, uh, uh, it's consistent with causality, you should be able to conclude that the transfer function um, satisfies the, the, the analyticity on upper half plan, it, it's it's bounded on upper half plan and so on. And of course it's unitary and so on. It's a, it would be a consistent check and it's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, if, so let's move forward. Okay, now let's just come to a more interesting question. So starting from three, four, so yeah, let me just briefly say, um, so uh, for, for problem three, I better, so sorry, for problem four and five, I'm, I'm going to mostly use the mathematics just to show how we solve the problem. And for, for problem three, uh, yeah, I think how to derive, how to think, Think of this narrow energy application and how to derive this this uh, dispersive sum rule, some some equalities. I think Simon already discussed in his lectures, so I may not. So I don't want to repeat or, but but if okay, but uh, I mean it, it, it's okay if you want me repeat some of this derivation or or go through some details. I'm fine. So. How about, how do you think? It depends. Okay. Okay, uh, if no, I just don't go through the derivation of this equation one again. Um, just, just focus on, just focus on how to solve the problem. But, but this one thing I like to, I like to uh, show is that, so, First, let's just think more carefully about how to obtain case of tractor dispersive sum rule. So that is that we we um, start with this this uh, this equation by assuming 
of course, by assuming a range boundedness of, of amplitude at, at high energy uh, uh, using, um, uh, I mean, th th this equation is valid for K is larger or equal to two. That means we assume the amplitude, the behavior, the range behavior of amplitude M is mostly like goes like uh, S, S to, uh, to uh, I mean, S squared. But, but it's actually just, uh, uh, I mean, approximate, approximately true. I mean, to make this equation uh, precise, precisely true, we have to uh, defy the, smear, the smeared uh, amplitude by integrating over, over T here. But but now we are just trying to play with the the cheap logic that is the forward limit function the forward limit sum rule so it's all fine we just we just take a look at this equation so um, for this equation you can of course deform the control so there are two ways uh, there are two uh, so as you deform the sorry as you deform the control you will you will have two contributions. The first contribution is no energy contribution. Is that at no energy you can just expand? You can just uh, use the no energy uh, amplitude for for scanner effective field theory, and uh, the the control actually just to, uh, just picks some picks up some um, some residues for this expression, and uh, but at high energy, I mean just just start starting with the uh, heavy mass m there will be branch cuts and you should integrate along the branch cuts that would give you some discontinuity and you have the two contributions one one for h channel and one action for u channel and by the way uh, this i'm not sure i get this equation 0 0.10 precisely true because there is additional factor of one over pi or something like that, but it doesn't really matter here. So I'm not, um, yeah, I'm fine with that. And um, so let's just consider the, the, the scanner, the real scanner. For real scanner, we have a we just have one spectral density, and we can actually use crossing symmetry to make these two contribution together. So the right hand side uh, just just boils down to this formula, and you can then use the partial wave partial wave expansion for the amplitude, and you will obtain this zero point uh, eleven, um, and the the condition, the unitar the unitarity condition is that rho, which is the spectral density, must be positive definitely. So, so, so in this in this thing, um, we want to derive equation one, but I'm not I'm not going through the details, but. Let's just think about how to when we can actually obtain this long constraint. So the long constraint encodes crossing symmetry, but how we can arrive at that. So if you just look at this this sort of uh, case subtracted dispersive sum rule, actually we would have to consider k k equals two and k equals four sum rules. So in that case, if you look at k equals two and k equals four sum rule, you will find that uh, you can have some uh, long constraint. So let me show you. This is a no energy amplitude, and this just a this is just I define function to take the residue and no and low energy. And let's just uh, consider two sub, uh, twice subtracted sum rule and fourth subtracted sum rule. That is k equals two and k k equals four. Uh, Sometimes we will call that, I mean, in most time we call actually call that uh, uh, spin two sum rule and spin four sum rule because it encodes the, 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 the range of spin two and four respectively. So if you evaluate that energy, it gives 
uh, for spin two some rule it gives this for spin four some rule it gives this so you find actually we have a uh, uh two places and both of them both of these two places uh, contain the same information that is g4 so that means we can cancel g4 and to establish a long constraint and this is indeed true so let's do this game for heavy parts we have a we have a for um, spin two sum rule and for spin four sum rule, and we can of course uh, read off the the coefficients of 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 t because we actually expand it around the forward limit. So from now energy, you notice the coefficient for t squared and for spin two sum rule and just and the coefficient for spin four sum rule are the same. They they are all the g four so. We can actually just read off the coefficient of t squared and read off the coefficient of t uh, for t equals zero. Uh, the, I mean, the, 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 the term for t equals zero. And you identify these two things that will give you the non-constraint. And this is precisely this thing. It's precisely, it's precisely uh, the last equation, of equation, the last equation of equation one in the problem set. Yeah. So this is the idea how we derive long constraint. So now let's move to a little bit interesting case is that the complex scanner. So the complex scanner is actually a little bit more similar to graviton amplitude Simon uh, discussed in his lectures. So let's see how it works. So for complex scanner, we can actually we have we 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 uh, it's better to keep track of the kinematic configuration precisely. That means that we consider three different three different amplitudes with actually different configurations. Uh, by configuration, I mean you fix T or you fix U or you fix S. So for example, we can consider five 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 bar five bar five. And that I denote it as the F to the S and U. Um, and we can also consider phi, phi, phi bar, phi bar that I denote it as S of S, uh, F of S and T. And we can also, again, just, you know, just do permutation of this amplitude. We can get phi, phi bar, phi, phi bar that we denote it as F of, as a function of U and T. So then we actually we actually have three different sum rules. Now this it's it's completely different. Now it's now it's actually more complicated than the real scanner because now we actually have three different sum rules. Um. Yeah, but to look at this three different sum rules, uh, before we do this, uh, it's actually. Uh, pretty interesting to note to note one thing is that uh, for real scanner for real scanner uh, I, I I use spin two and spin four some rule to derive the non constraint but actually they are coming from spin two full subtracted some rule why do I say that um, I mean so you will notice that for this thing, this low additional S prime, but we can actually just define a um, twice subtract some rule with the with the full. So uh, I, I call it full subtract some rule. Uh, then it's actually because we have S prime here. So, so what what's a, what's the difference? The difference that suppose suppose now we take k equals zero. It's not allowed by our assumption, but we just take uh, take k equals zero just to see how this thing is different from this thing. So if we take if we take k equals zero, and the no energy part and no energy part, if we take the residue around s equals zero, we actually just obtain the no energy amplitude with s equals zero. But for full subtractive sum rule, 
but sorry, for full sum rule, if we take the residue around the s equals s equals s prime, we obtain the real Lagrange amplitude m, which is a function of s prime m t. So this is the difference. So this two thing equivalent in a sense that we can actually just start with the just start with the full subtracted twice subtracted sum rule. Um, and we get a we get the result, but now we expand for both s prime around s prime equals zero and t equals zero. So it's actually just equivalent. It's sh it's shown here that this is a full thing that I divided by s minus s prime. So and we can do we can evaluate the L, the no energy part, but now we actually expand. Both uh, for both S prime and T, and it's again G four appears uh, several times, but it's only two of them are independent. It gave, gives a long constraint, independent long constraint. So uh, this th this is a difference, but it's just actually equivalent. So for complex scanner, I I just just for uh, for simplicity, I just use this full subtractive sum rule. So we, we have three different sum rules. First is this one. And uh, the second is this one. Why it's FST plus FUT? Because we want to make it uh, symmetric in A and U. And we can actually just, we can, of course, th this is twice subtracted sum rule. We have two twice subtracted sum rule for complex scalar, but we can again actually define a triple subtracted sum rule uh, for complex scalar. That is, we, uh, that, that is we define, we use F S T minus F U T so that it's as asymmetric in A S and U. And then we can we can uh, subtract it by s plus t to the to the third, and this defines the triple subtractive sum rule. So as we do so, we can follow the same game. We contour we we deform the contour to pick up the residues and energy and to expand to do the Fourier uh, and sorry, to do the partial wave expansion for high energy. And we establish some coefficient for energy, for we represent the Wilson coefficient at low energy in terms of, a, you know, a, a sum over high energy stuff. So let me show how it works. So this is a complex thing. So for this complex thing, I just write the amplitude here. For, and uh, we have a, this is a two twice subtracted sum rules. Um, this is the heavy part. We can, of course, also define a triple subtracted sum rules now. Um, and we can follow the same game and to, to, to read of the how, for example, how the energy, the Wilson coefficient is represented in terms of the heavy part. Yeah. So I will give you the mathematical notebook. So, but I'm not going through the details of how it's really worked out in Mathematica. But the answer is that uh, if we just consider the uh, twice subtracted sum rule and triple subtracted sum rule, you will find uh, we actually just we actually just find uh, um, uh, one long constraint for one over m to the six and uh, two long constraints for one over m to the eight. But if we allow single subtraction, that means we can actually define this sum rule. It's different from this sum rule by just the power of subtraction because it just subtract uh, once. So if you use this, if you use this subtraction, and to, to do the all to do the all the games all over again, you will find it's 
gives more lung constraint. Like you will find there will be one lung constraint and M, one of M to the fourth and two lung constraints at one of M to the six and three lung constraints and one of M to the eight. So for more details, please just, please just check the mathematical notebook and notice this, this is just, uh, this, uh, this function eval M no for odd is just the, the odd sub, the odd subtractive sum rule. So you can use either k equals one or k equals three to check how many non constraints you will have. That is that, uh, so here is just some eyeball walk and you can choose to not do eyeball walk, but use a, a clever, more clever way to do is that you really uh, just, just to find uh, the non constraints, directly find the non constraints and yeah, you will find these are all of the non constraints you can find. So please just have fun with my mathematical notebook. It's, I think it's interesting. Yeah, are there any questions? Maybe I'm not being very clear. So are there any questions for problem three? No? Okay. I mean, I mean, just a clarification of the terminology, you know, like, so when you, this uh, adjective of how much subtraction is a question of how many denominator factors do you shift? Is it? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So uh, in general, yeah, uh, we, we divide it. The amplitude by factor of s times s plus q to some power because it's a symmetric in s and q. So if k, get, if k is zero, that is the uh, no any just no any subtraction. But if k equals q or four or six, you just subtract more and more. In that case, what you will what you will probe is actually higher and higher dim uh, dimensional uh, Wilson coefficients. Yeah. Yeah, I don't uh, see any further questions. Yeah, okay. Then I'm keep going. Sorry if I, if I am a bit fast. Um, yeah. So finally, the most exciting part is the let's really do the game. Let's really let's see let's really see how we can use causality unitarity that gives us the dispersion relation, and we use that to really bound the energy Wilson coefficients. Yeah. So. Let's see. So, oh, yeah, we can give up the solution.pdf, just focus on the problem in the mathematical file. So for so suppose let, let let's let's accept this the, this bunch of uh, bunch of equations uh, which are derived from dispersion relation. And if we have them. What, what can we conclude? So uh, a simple way to do is that uh, you can just eyeball it. Like for example, you can, if you take G4 here and you take G2 here, you can very simple, uh, uh, simply eyeball that you can prove that G4 is less or equal one G2 over two. Yeah, for simplicity, let's just take M, this, this capital M to one. This is simple eyeball job, but for proof this G3 uh, less than three G2, it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, you can still eyeball it. Let's, let's see. Uh, yeah. So let's see. So for example, to prove G4 less than G2, this bound, we can use the light part. The light part gives 
the convolution that G2 over 2 minus G4. And we can then use the same convolution for the heavy part that gives us an uh, um, um, average of some, some stuff. And that stuff has to be positive for any, for any mass larger than capital M and for any spin. But now there's no any spin. So we can just check it's positive for any mass larger than one. Well. And of course, it's simple. You can eyeball it. For this bound, G3 less than 3G2, it's a little bit more complicated, but you can still eyeball it. So for example, you just, just make a compilation for 3G2 minus G3, and you can uh, uh, make the same compilation for heavy parts. And now the Philo the final expression for heavy part is a little bit more complicated. It, it depends on M and it also depends on J, but you can also easily prove it's all positive for adding M larger than one and for adding even spin. And a nice way to show this is to make the less contour plot. Oh, what, what, what's wrong? Okay, maybe something wrong, but. Just to see this, uh, this, uh, this use the list control plot, you will find there's no any negative place. It's just all mac. It, it's just all positive, and you can also clearly see it uh, goes from small to large and so on. So, but this is just eyeball walk. But, but for a little bit more complicated bounds, for example, this bound, you can never eyeball it. It's, 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 it's complicated. So the idea is that uh, to prove this sort of bounds, we should use some, some, we should use, we should take some tools to use like from mathematics. So the tool, uh, I mean, a cheap version of this tool is the linear programming. Let's stop sharing and let me share again, but with the, but with my iPad. Yeah, so now we introduce, so, so let's now move to really think about linear programming and even STPP. So please refer, if you want to know more details, please just refer this website. It's a uh, GitHub come uh, from David Simmons Dolphin. There's a very details about the menu of STPP and like how to install STPP and, and how to use STPP and so on. And, and even for some source code, you can find on that. Also, you can take a look at uh, this paper by from uh, David Simstofen and maybe some other people for more details about STPP. Yeah. So let's start a quick tutorial on STPP. So let's, let's just start with the simple example that we can actually eyeball. The simple example we can actually eyeball just to show how linear programming and even semi definite programming works. So the simple problem, the simple example is the problem three for scanner EFT, like I just showed you before, like G, this, this bunch of things, G2, G3, and the non-constraint is all we, 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 we want. And so that is that uh, now we aim to find now we aim to find the upper bound of G three over G two, because G two is uh, positive from this equation, so we can divide it, divide G three by G two. So we aim to find upper bound of G three over G two. How do we do? So let's deload it. This guy a one, this guy a two, and this guy a three. So the idea is that uh, we should find minus a2 plus x1 times a1 plus x3 times a3 to be positive for all even spin and for, sorry, it's, it's a typo. For m larger or equal to 
capital M, but I just set M to be one for simplicity. And so that is that uh, we should find X1 and X3 such that this inequality is valid. It's always positive for adding even spin and adding any M larger than capital M larger than one. So if this, if we find such X1 and X3, if we, we find a bunch of X1 and X3, but, and the next step is that we look at this thing, but now at, at low energy. At low energy, it gives minus G3 plus X1 times G2 is positive. So the idea, then from this equation, we can conclude that uh, G3 over G2 is less than X1. So now that is that we find the positive combination, but there are a bunch of them. There are a bunch of solutions for this positivity to hold. But now we, we say, hey, let's just minimize this X1. If we, can minim if we can find the minimum value of X1, we can prove a pretty nice bound for G3 over G2. So let's... So to conclude, we actually think of, think of this problem as an algorithm. This algorithm says we minimize x1 subject to this equation to be positive for any even spin and m and m larger than one. So this is our algorithm, our algorithm for the simple problem. You can eyeball it, but you can actually establish it, uh, the algorithm for it. Um, but it's not actually pretty general algorithm. I mean, it just it, it can just work for the simple problem. But the more general algorithm, we can think of it like this. I call it more algorithm-like stuff, algorithm, more algorithm-like algorithm. So suppose we now introduce a vector called X. X is a vector, it's a three-dimensional vector. It has X1, X2, and X3. And then we introduce another vector, we call it C, which is one, zero, zero. And we, we introduce another vector, which is, which is A, that is just a vector of A1, A2, and A3 here, A1, A2, and A3. So if we have this thing, how we can make the algorithm more, gen uh, more general and more abstract. The idea is that uh, the algorithm now is we minimize x dot c subject to a dot x plus b is positive and sub subject to x dot something plus something is zero. So this is actually just a normalization condition. So this thing is pretty true. If you say it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's just a linear programming problem. It says, let's minimize x dot c subject to some positive condition, a dot x plus b and x dot something plus something x zero. And for this, for this simple problem, um, all we need to do is that we take C to be this guy and A to be this guy. And this, this guy to be zero, one, zero, and this guy to be one. And this is precisely the linear programming pro problem. And, the, and to what, what, I, what, I, what I established, what I form here, this format, is precisely the linear optimization function in Mathematica, in Mathematica. Okay, does it make sense? Uh, are there any problems? If no, I'm going to show how Mathematica look like. Okay, let's see how Mathematica look like. Okay, now let's really look at this problem. 
uh, look at this problem by using mathemat by using Mathematica. So, for example, for this simple example, uh, just like I introduced uh, you, you have a vector to two to four and zero, and you want to prove this bound, for example. And uh, then what, what should we do? We normalize, we normalize, we take, we, we introduce the norm vector, which normalize G4. And what we aim to minimize is, is this guy. And the, the, the positive condition, we want to make sure it's positive for all J, for all spin and mass. It's just the heavy part of the of of the same thing. Of it's just this thing, but evaluate it at heavy at heavy parts. So we just use the linear optimization, like just the format that I, I I just I just give you, I just introduce. Um, we minimize this thing subject to uh, subject to a dot b uh, plus something and. Uh, and some some uh, is positive, and uh, something is is precisely zero. Maybe it's not clear, and so let's take a look at the help stuff just to make sure. It's clear. So this is precisely what uh, what what I what I tell you. Um, so this is a linear optimization. Is that uh, we minimize c dot x subject to constraint a dot x plus b is positive, and a equality times x plus b equality is precisely zero for all this thing, for all uh, c a b a q. B Q uh, belongs to this this field. So this is the format. So we can do this game again and again. For example, let's let's just make sure I do it right. Just show you like for this thing, uh, we have long, we have OBJ, and we have mad. This is how mad look like. You sample different J. And but of course you have to truncate it. Otherwise you have to go to infinity. But it's not necessary. You can truncate it to to actually to twenty is is good enough. But we, let's just take to forty. And you can of course sample m. And you use this lean optimize linear optimizing code, and you can obtain the answer. And for, for this bound G3 less than three G2, we can do the same thing, but now we choose G2, G3, zero. And uh, we can also do the same thing. And we we use the format and we uh, throw it into Mathematica and we can prove the bound. Okay, so this two guys, you, you this two guys are actually simple. We can eyeball it. But how about this a little bit more complicated one? For this one, I still choose G2, G3, and zero. We just ignore G4. And, but you see, uh, different from this one, we actually just, just use a different norm because, because the all thing we, we want to establish is some positive thing. If something is positive, that means, uh, that means if we want to prove lower bound of G3, we have to make sure something is positive so the coefficient of g3 is one that can prove g3 is larger than something but if we want to prove the upper bound of g3 we have to make sure minus g3 minus something is positive so that minus g3 is larger than something so that g3 is less than something so this is idea so we can well, the, the all thing different from this bound is we just change the sign of law and we can just do it. Bang. It's, it gives you G3 larger than minus 10.6 and so on G2. Interesting, right? 
And we can, of course, actually improve the bound by introducing more long constraint. Right? Like we let's introduce more con long constraint here, like M M5, so that the heavy part is, is has one more element, and we can we can improve the bound by include the additional long constraint. Now it's four dimensional vector. So we can do that. We can of course do that again and again. You see this two bond actually not improved at all. It's automatically optimal. But this guy, it this number actually uh, has changed a bit if you notice. This is 10.61 and this is uh, 10.60, uh, 606. Okay, this is just simple demonst demonstration how you can think of uh, linear programming and how you can simply use Mathematica to do this. But uh, let's just take a look at how to use STPB, which is actually more powerful and we can use it to do a lot of things like that we can use it to bound, to bound, to prove EFT bounds. And we can actually use it to, to, to find the islands if, if uh, conformal field theory, like just the numerical conformal bootstrap stuff and so on. And uh, let's do that. Just a moment. So this linear optimize this linear optimizing can actually be extended to matrix. It's not necessarily to just polynomial or number, it can be actually matrix. So the most important algorithm we have to remember if you if you want to play with STPB and so on, you should the, the, the most important thing you should remember is just this just this algorithm, is that we maximize A dot Z over real number Z subject to a positive condition that is Z N times W J N, which could be a function of X of a positive X and sum over N to some from zero to some capital N. And this guy is a positive guy. For any positive x and for a small j larger than one but less than but less or equal to capital J. And of course, additional constraint is n dot z equals one. This is just a normalization. This is just normalization. By the way, I actually forgot to write here this w j n x here is a matrix. Let's see. It's, it's a matrix, um, W, J, N, X here. It's a matrix, so like W, J, N, 1, 1, X, W, J, N, 1, 2, X, W, J, 1, M, J, X, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it's a, it's a M, J, times MJ matrix. So this is basically uh, what what HD, what HTPB in mathematics, uh, the, the Mathematica version of HTPB will use. So that's why I say it's the most important algorithm we should remember or what well, actually, you know what? Maybe it's not most important, but it's the simplest algorithm we, 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 we should remember. Um, so let's just also take a look at the bound G3 over G2, but now think of it using this algorithm, this SD, SDPB algorithm. Now we take A to be minus one, zero, zero. 
and we take n to be 0, minus 1, 0. And wj1 is a1, wj2 is a2, wj3 is a3. And m squared is just 1 plus x. Or more precisely, if we, if we restore the heavy mass, the gap, it should be this. So let me just remind you, this is A1, this is A2, this is A3. This is A1, A2, A3. So how this algorithm works? So it's just, um, it's just we wish to find Z1, Z2, Z3, such that Z1 times A, uh, Z1 times A1 plus Z2 times A2 plus this Z3 times A3 is positive for all J, which J is now is in this case it's just a spin, uh, it's just a, a even spin. But of course, in practice, you have to truncate it to some maximum number of spin, and m squared equals one plus x where x plus uh, x is positive. And notice there, uh, it's subject to two conditions. One is positive condition, one is a normalization. And now normalization is minus z2 is equal to one. So if you find some coefficients, z1, z2, z3, to satisfy this thing, what you can conclude in, at low energy is that you have Z1 times G2 minus Z3 is positive. And of course, it implies G3 is less than Z1 times G2. So the final step you will have to do is to maximize, notice this algorithm used maximize rather than minimize. So the, the final step is that you maximize minus Z1 such that you minimize the one. That will prove the bound. So this is idea, this is simple example. I hope it's clear. Yeah. Are there any questions? Maybe it's a little bit more abstract for those people who are not working with this. And I'm sorry if I'm not being too clear. Yeah, I don't see any. Yeah. Questions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then let's go to the final part. How to how do we really use STPP? So all I do is actually the cheap way. Um, but if you can understand the, or the, the, the source code of STPB or in some, some libraries uh, from David Simstofen, you can maybe use a more brilliant way like to run STPB on, on um, hyper performance computers and so on. But now the cheap way I'm gonna introduce is just the cheap way that is we use Docker and we use Mathematica. So um, let's see. So let's just, let, let me just try to introduce the format in Mathematica and I'll just show you how I use how I use how, how I use it. So the format of STP in Mathematica uh, boils down to this important function called SDP. It has three it has three arguments. One is object, one is norm, one is called matrices with prefactor. Actually, I should say positive positive matrices with prefactor. And uh, what is OBJ? OBJ is actually just A in this algorithm. It's just A in this algorithm. The norm is just N in this algorithm. 
And this positive matrix of the prefecture is, of course, just a bunch of this guy. But it has its own, it has its own format in uh, in uh, mathematical version of the STPP. Is that uh, the positive matrix is with prefecture takes its a list in Mathematica. It's a list from P1 to PJ, where PJ, where P is, the format of P is a positive matrix with prefecture. This function has two arguments. One is a prefecture, which we just take it as a constant. For more detail, you can refer the HTTP menu or, or uh, David's paper. But now all we have, all we usually do is just to take the prefecture to be constant. And then this thing is just a matrix, what we will use. Notice we have, we have matrix W, J, N. So we have N from zero to N. So this gives us this, uh, we have a WJ11, it's an element of matrix for zero and it's elements of the, it's the same elements, but for a different matrix. And just list, you just try to, I mean, it's a little bit more abstract, but you just try to understand how to write this matrix for, for your own problem you want to solve. But I mean, for me, I always have a tip to see if, it, if I got it right or not, is that you just notice this thing, you have to find, you have three, you have three brackets here. Yeah, it's a maybe, it's my tip, but maybe it's stupid, but I find it's useful for me to do standard check if I write the positive matrix right. So this is basically the, 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 the mathematical format. Oh, uh, this, uh, this uh, question. Yes, this algorithm can be used to constrain coefficients of gravitational EFT, of course. It's just the same, it, it's, it's the same story. Like in gravitational EFT, we can, we can establish, we can establish the, the dispersion relation which relates the low energy gravitational EFT to unloading some of positive stuff at high energy in terms of partial waves. And then we can, uh, we can again to get uh, some, uh, some equations that uh, write the, uh, the low energy Wilson coefficients in terms of uh, partial waves with, uh, with some positive coefficients and so on. And so, uh, we have, we have, we we want we want to prove some bounds. So we throw the heavy parts into the STPP. We ask some positive some positive compilation, and that will transform at low energy to some to some compilation of recent coefficients to be positive. So it's the same way to prove the um, to constrain the recent coefficients in gravitational EFT. Yeah, so it's all I have to wrote. So let's just uh, end sharing and show how it works. Um, let's see. Okay, now it's, uh, I, I believe it's the most exciting moment for my tutorial for this tutorial. So now let's just first give you the STPP wrapper that we usually use in Mathematica. So this is a STPP wrapper written by Simone. So, but to do this, you will have to lead the STP, stpp.m package. And you will also have to install Docker. So, you can refer, let me, sorry. You can refer 
to this website, which is a GitHub of David Simstofen, and you will find this is a content called installation and usage. And there's a bunch of different instructions for, for you to install it. For example, the simplest way, just like I, 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 we usually do is the Docker instruction. We have download Docker. Uh, as you download Docker, you can just run this comment on your terminal and it will just take the image of uh, STPB from, 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 uh, from uh, uh, GitHub here. Yeah. As you do so, if you do so, you install Docker and you, and you can, of course, uh, yeah, you can take stpb.m from that website again. As you do so, you may need this wrapper. So first of all, it's just to set some working directories and you have to load this package and this wrapper. Uh, all things this wrapper, this wrapper do uh, is basically first, you have to write the so-called the so-called XML file. This file actually just 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 uh, records all the information you want to give STPB and let it solve. So it automatically writes XML file and it gives it gives to STPB and then STPB just 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 decode XML file and 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 uh, start to start to compute it, start to search for solutions. And this get functional is just some some function make you just to um, parse from from the outputs of STPP. Just uh, is just to translate the STPP output to to human language that you can read. And uh, and just to notice, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm not sure how many of you are Mac or, or Mac user and how many of you are, are, are Windows user. It's it would be different for this for this uh, for this uh, for this code. Like uh, there there are two differences. First, for Mac user, uh, what what should you what what you should use to to do this run process is to to tell to tell really tell it where is the Docker is amply it's usually it's default unless you 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 set your own directory for it. So the default is in application Docker app contents resource Bing and Docker. But for for Windows user, it would be different. For Windows user, you don't use you don't use this line. Rather, you use this line. It's a uh, power, you, you call PowerShare and you tell PowerShare to initiate the Docker and then you do all the things. And also for Windows user, the big difference is that you don't use this slash, rather you use this slash to, 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 to represent the, the terminal comment. Yeah. Yeah, let's try to do that. Let's add the directory and let's node this thing. Hopefully, I am doing it good. And so let's do this bounce. Uh, we set LOM, OBJ, and the uh, positive matrices with the factors. And then you can just solve it. You can throw it into SDBB and make and net SDB solve it. But remember, if you solve it once, um, you will have existing an existing XML file, and you will also have some output uh, folder and also some so-called checkpoint for checkpoint JSON file. So if you want to run it again for the same lane, you have to delete the XML file and the JSON file. Uh, the reason is that the XML file is just all the data you have. So if you change your data and you run it again, 
it has to write another XML file. So if you don't delete XML file, it, it will take the default that the existing XML file. So it doesn't change. It doesn't make sense for you to rerun it. So you have to delete the XML file. And uh, for checkpoints, checkpoint is just some points that SDBV will check. So if you don't delete the checkpoints, it would actually affect the search solution for SDBB because it assumes uh, some checkpoint exists there. And you start with those, SDB, SDBB will start with those checkpoints and to continue doing searching. So you have to delete XML file and JSON file. So you have to delete them first with the SDBB. Um, uh, yeah, it take a few minutes, uh, take a few seconds. So let's try, let's wait. Yeah, uh, yeah, let's, never mind. So, so this outer, it's a list. It has two elements. The first element is just the, all the out, all the output formats for STPP. I mean, it's just a process, process format for STPP. Like uh, it's, it tells you the time, of course, the directory, with the output directory, with the checkpoint directory, and so on. And it's just all the, uh, I mean, all the options for STPP, like, uh, uh, the maximal allowed iteration search in search, the maximal now time in like something like this. I'm not I'm I'm not going through details of this. What what does this mean? You can you can refer to STBB menu or David's paper for details. But then this is how it runs. It runs blah 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 and oh wow it gives you a solution. If it gives, if it find a solution, it, it will tell you that um, you find you found you find primal dual optimal solution. And there's also uh, up, uh, it's also possible for you to find uh, to 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 have a so-called uh, math complementary. If you find math complementary, it you know what I mean it didn't find any solution. So maybe it's some physical problem. Maybe it's just some, some data problem. You have to really refine it or you have to think more carefully. And this all things are just the coefficients you can read. And the second element of outer is just the directory for directory. It saves the output. So you can use the get functional to get the coefficients the, the coefficients, the Z, the coefficient is just all the coefficients. And as dot the basis you chose, you can establish the bounds. Pretty cool, huh? I think it's really cool. And uh, like we can of course prove this bound. I do the same thing, but gives a different norm, different OBJ and different matrix. And we throw it into STPP and give the solution. And for this guy, it's the same. We give a norm OBJ matrix and we throw it into STPP and this will find a primal dual optimal solution. Yeah, that's all. And we still have a, uh, yeah, so are there any questions for S for STVB? No? Yeah, great. So can you see my screen for this problem set? Uh, yes, I think it, there's a mathematical, yeah, no, no, yes. Oh. Sorry, and let me try to share the screen again. Yeah, think now. So let's come to the a little bit more fancy and more complicated application of STPP. And it, it's actually more involved for when you have a graviton exchange, because when you have a graviton exchange in your EFT, 
you will have a gra the so-called graviton pole. As you have a graviton pole, that, that is the one over T stuff, you can use the forward limit stuff. Instead, as expanded by Simone, you should use the you should use a, a, a wave function to smear to smear to smear the, the, the amplitude. So that gives that is actually equivalent to you transform to the impact parameter space and you 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 um, consider the dispersion relation in impact parameter space. So this this is a, just a simple. I mean, it's not technically the real. Uh, the the we we are not really doing this thing, but it's just give give you some uh, taste of how that might work. So the problem is that uh, so we have to find a function that is positive in impact parameter and compact supporting moment space. So one diversion, well, it's a toy model. Is you consider this thing, you have a f of function of p. And you integrate against the cos L P P and from zero to one. So that and S, this S P must must has must have compact support. And you will you will transform to the impact parameter space F P. And uh, and uh, the requirement is that it must be uh, uh, you you have to uh, you require a normalization condition, and the question is that uh, um, how we can minimize the the width the width that is the average of b squared. So let's see how we do that. It's all here. Of course, I have to first define some integration rules so that I can do the integral. And uh, the, the search basis I chose, that means the, 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 the wave function, I choose the FP here, is that uh, it's this thing. It's a linear combination of this bunch of function. Let me show you more carefully. It's a linear combination of one minus P squared to, to uh, one minus p squared, the whole thing squared, and times p from p zero, p two, p three, uh, p, p to the cube, p to the fourth, and so on. And you can, of course, extend it to higher and higher power of p. That will make your search, that will make your solution more and more accurate. So as you do so, of course, uh, you have to normalize it because you have a normalization condition and, and you will find as you do so, if you use this basis, the, no, the normalization condition is just one, zero, 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 zero. And then you can define the wave. So the wave you define is you use your search basis that the functional basis you integrate again, uh, against the against b squared from b uh, from uh, over b from minus infinity to infinity it will take a bit long time so i'm not wrong it here but but the idea is that uh, as you have this you can set your problem you can tr you can translate your problem into stpp language so that is that uh, the thing you want to make it positive because you want to make this thing positive. So then you want to make it positive is that uh, you have this, you have your base, I call it base FB. That is the impact parameter space of your wave function. And uh, this thing to be positive, it's a, it's a bunch of matrix because you require it to be positive for adding B. So to do this, you just take B, from minus something to something uh, with just, I mean, the idea is that you sample the B um, as, as, as better, uh, I mean, as best as you can do. And this gives a, a positive matrix. And uh, to be more 
I mean, to be more accurate, you might want to make sure that the solution converges quickly and correctly. So in this case, you want to input the large B constraint. That, that, that is what this thing do. So it's an it's a additional positive constraint. That means this thing, of course, should be positive for large B. So just take the large B limit, and so you can random, randomly samples in very, very large B. And uh, the OBJ is just the minus of width because you want to minimize width. That means you maximize minus width. And the norm is just, is just, is just this thing. And then you can, again, do the same thing. You can uh, use this positive matrix with prefactors, with the prefactor, and with, with the positive matrix, you, you, you want to you want to give it to STPP. As you do, as you have all of this, you can then run. It will take a bit long time because a bit longer time because I I I, I refine the sample pretty careful. So I really do a lot of points. So that make STPP uh, spend more time do, doing searching. So as you do so, you can find a solution. And as you and uh, this will give you the minimal width. And what I find is approximately like 9.90A73 and so on. And, uh, it, and it's approximately like a pi to the squared. And this is how we use SDPB to solve problem five. Okay, are there any question? That's, that's all. And of course we can test the positivity, you can just, uh, extract the function of ex extract the 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 coefficient stvp solves and and dot base fb and you search to see if it is positive in for any b and so on so that's all uh hopefully i really demonstrate at least some basics of how to use stvp and uh, that's all for my tutorial okay uh thanks are there any questions uh comments can i don't answer yeah, no okay i don't see any specific questions okay so then let's uh, 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 thank you again uh, for this next tutorial thanks, uh, thanks. and um, yeah so we will meet at uh, next at two o'clock uh, in the time uh, for you know uh, Suman Kundu's uh, tutorial uh, okay thanks everybody thank you yeah thanks thanks bye have a good day